Well, it came as quite a surprise, I have to say, when I received the invitation to accept the award. I had to sit down for an hour. It was something that just blew me away. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've been a lecturer at, at St John's for, for more than a quarter of a century. It's funny because theology is not one of those subjects that, that often gets, gets in the limelight, is it? No, I, I suppose it often gets into the limelight for the wrong reason sometimes, but um, my particular area of work has been in the area of church history, and so I've worked with people who have been involved both in theological colleges and in universities and other tertiary institutions, particularly in the area of religious history. That's been the area where I've, I think I've made my contribution. Mm. And of course, I mean, the, your, your book, uh, Christianity in, in Aotearoa, is a history of church and society in New Zealand. It's, it's the standard text, really, isn't it? Well, so. no one else has been silly enough to try to, to write the uh, overall story of the history of Christianity in New Zealand up to this point. And I was asked, invited to do it um, now over 20 years ago. And it was quite a challenge. I have to say that um, although it's gone through three editions, uh, an enormous amount of research has gone on um, since it was published, and so there's probably need for a, a fourth edition. <laughs> Is that going to be one of your little projects running on now? Oh. You're officially retired? Well, I have a number of other projects to finish <laughs> off first, yes, but maybe. I mean, the, the book is, I guess, coming, coming at it as a migrant myself. One of the, the, the areas that really spoke to me was your description of the, of the early migrants coming into New Zealand who clung on to their, their faith with... with Fervour is the, the only word. Yes. Well, it, it's just, it's fascinating that, that there was that, that incredible devotion to, to their faith. Yes, well, I think that one of the interesting things for me about the 19th century, or the, the coming of Christianity in New Zealand, is it comes in two forms. There's the missionary form that comes among, to Māori first, and so that you have the arrival of the church here in New Zealand before 1840, before the treaty is signed, and the emergence beginning of what we can call a Māori church, speaking and worshipping in Māori, singing hymns in Māori. And then you have the waves of settlers coming in, particularly after 1840. And there's, there's an interesting question, where was the Bible in their baggage? Was it on top of their suitcase or was it buried down there? Uh, for many people who have migrated, the whole issue about adjusting to a new land has been helped, I think, by their religious background. And I often talk to students picking up the image of the, the Jews going into exile. How do you sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And rather jokingly, I say, you sing it louder. <laughs> you say it in the same way, but you sing it louder. And so people brought their hymn books, their prayer books. They brought their church structures, although they built in wood rather than in stone. And so there's an element of what um, Peter Lynham and I have called transplanted Christianity. People transplanted their Christianity. But then the question is, how did they begin to adjust and shape it in the new context? And that's, I mean, that's, again, one of the fascinating bits of the book is, is how, how you see Māori who, who had very early on, um, I mean, we, we've told the story on, on this programme of Tarore and, mm. and her, mm. her gospel, yes. which in many ways changed, changed the world. Yes. And, and so you, you have these two strands that are sometimes working together, but quite often apparently opposed. <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes in tension. Um, I think one of the things that we've recognised as historians more and more is the aspect of what we call about indigenous agency, that uh, the missionaries brought the gospel, but then Māori accepted and responded, often in ways that were not always exactly what the missionaries expected. And so you have this indigenous response and Māori became very significant evangelists amongst their own people. And there is this dimension that's not recorded in... Well, it, it's becoming recorded more and more in the history books as people take note of this. It was the same right throughout the Pacific, the dimension of indigenous agency, uh, people contributing to the evangelization process. So missionaries would go to villages for the first time as Europeans, no other Europeans there, and find that people were already singing hymns and worshipping, and they would find that somebody had come who had learnt those things in a mission station and were acting as evangelists among their own people. The other aspect, I suppose, to, to those days was the whole colonisation side of it, because in many ways the church and the, the British government seemed to work in cahoots. They came as a, they came as a package, didn't they? Yes and no. Um, there are elements where you find the church acting as almost, as uh, one religious sociologist talks about it, as a sacred canopy. 
um, secularizing, providing the um, support for government activity. But then you find the individuals who are very critical of government policy, people like Octavius Hadfield, for example, who was a missionary down at Otaki, who later became the second Bishop of Wellington. He was said to be the most hated Pākehā in New Zealand in 1860 because he wrote these letters very critical of the government and the way in which it had claimed land at Waitara. And that was the start of the Taranaki Wars mm -hmm. and then the New Zealand Wars. And he was really calling the government to account that they were not honouring the treaty which had been signed. And so you find within the church these, these prophetic voices that stand out um, while the majority of settlers who came to New Zealand the thing that they needed in order to improve their lot, and that was the reason why they came here, they needed land. And of course the question of how they acquired their land became one of the real tension points between Māori and Pākehā. And this is where colonial Christianity clashed, I think, with missionary Christianity. Mm. It's a very complex story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. and the, the, the interesting, what makes it interesting is that even today you see that the echoes of those clashes from, what, 150 years ago, are still the, the clashes that, that we often have today. Well, I think the work of the Waitangi Tribunal has been really significant in recovering and making available in print a lot of the oral tradition, a lot of the stories that come from the past about la how land was alienated, confiscated, how it was taken unfairly. Uh, sometimes the church was complicit, complicit in that process. And so the, the Waitangi Tribunal, I think, has been really important in helping people face what's happened in the past. And then through the settlements, um, there has been some reconciliation, some um, almost confession um, through the apologies that have been given. Mm. And I think that's the way that we can build and, and go into the future. Because you've got some experience of being a stranger in a strange land yourself, because you went to Papua New Guinea for five years? Five it? years, yeah. yes, yes. What made you go? Well, um, I'd been a stranger in a strange land before that. I'd gone to the United States. And, in fact, I think I experienced more culture shock going to the United <laughs> States um, than I did going to Papua New Guinea. Uh, and that was our first overseas experience. Uh, I was invited to go and teach in a theological college. Uh, I'd had a little bit of experience teaching in Dunedin and in Christchurch, where I was in the ministry. And I had done further work in the area of church history. And so it seemed a, a great opportunity. I was in my 30s, young, young family. Um, I was particularly interested in missionary history. I had done my doctorate around the history of mission, particularly attitudes to India in the early 19th century. And so here was a chance to go to a country that was um, within the Pacific region, um, supported by the church, and to work in a theological college. And then you also went to, to Aberdeen, which of course was where your own migrant family had originated yes. from. So what was that like? Well, after the year in Chicago, which was a wonderful year of postgraduate study at the University of Chicago, um, I went on to Aberdeen to do my doctorate. And my first experience of arriving in Scotland was to think I knew why my ancestors had left. <laughs> um, but we really enjoyed living in Scotland. The people were warm and accepting. They knew where New Zealand was, which was rather different from many of the people we encountered in uh, the States at that time. And you would just say that you came from New Zealand and they say, oh, I've got a relative living in such and such a place. Um, there were these family connections. Yeah. Yeah. My own family came out, um, the first of my relatives came out in, the 18, in 1850 and then others in the 1860s. And uh, they all came out from um, Scotland bar one who came from Southern Ireland. Um, so I have very strong Scottish roots. And going back into the Church of Scotland, I'd been brought up a Presbyterian. There was an element in which there was a sense of going home, but the home was different from the experience of uh, growing up in New Zealand. So now you're retired. Does that mean that you're going to sit and watch the roses grow? I suspect not. Well, uh, retirement allows you to make choices about what you want to do. Um, I have a grandson day once a fortnight with my little grandson <laughs> and look after him for the day. And that's something that's really pleasurable for me. And I want to be involved as an active grandparent as much as I can. But I'm, I'm involved in ongoing historical work. Um, I'm currently editing a history of the Anglican um, uh, Diocese of Auckland. There are 10 of us involved in that. And we're getting at a critical stage where all the chapters have been written. And now I have to sort of put them into line and, and do all the corrections and so on. And then beyond that, um, last year we marked the 200th anniversary of the birth of Bishop Selwyn and his wife Sarah. Bishop Selwyn was the first Anglican bishop in New Zealand. 
and we have a symposium at St John's College and I'm going to, I'm editing the papers of that collection and hoping to have those published. And beyond that, there's a parish history and some family history. <laughs> so, no, there's lots to do, <laughs> as well really as smell the roses. Of course, you <laughs> get some time for roses. And lots of tramping. <laughs> Lovely, well, it's great to meet you. Thank you very much indeed for coming in.